Well, it's Palm Sunday. I'm here at the house because we're to shelter in place. And I want to bring this message to you and hopefully keep us worshiping together. Thank you for uh, clicking on the link. Thank you for being a part of it. As always, if you'll click like or share, then um, you can access all of this on YouTube easier. We're learning as this process goes. Brother Larry is going to be posting the music onto our Facebook page. Uh, be looking for that on Sunday morning. You can click on that first and worship with music and praise with him and Miss Vera. Uh, I know there's a special coming for that. Also, since it's Palm Sunday, it's a very special time. I know I wish we could be together for this, but at the same time, hey, we're going to make the best we can with it. And Easter is right around the corner. I was really hoping we'd be back together by Easter, but apparently we won't. So we're going to make the best of every situation. We're going to give glory to God. And as always, if you need me for something, you can call me. I'm going to have my email up. And um, if there's any prayer requests or anything you want to bring in, we'll make it part of our prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. All right. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, and we're going to be doing verses 37 through 40. So if you'll join with me with that, we're going to open with prayer. And I hope that the Spirit of God has his way with us this morning, that we can say we had church, even at home. We had church. Father, we thank you for this. We pray that you use it to your glory. And Father, we ask that my people be um, fed spiritually and that they grow spiritually and see opportunities to serve in times like these. If our neighbors need us, if people need our, our ministry, if people need us to reach out to them, Lord, we pray that you open the door, allow us to see the need so that we can meet it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 19, 37 through 41. We're going to talk about the sorrowing Savior, how Jesus wept over the city. We start and we pick up in verse 37. He says, Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. I have been there, I have stood there, I have stood on the Mount of Olives and seen the path going down. I have been blessed to be able to stand in the city and see the path that he would have taken to come down. And I just want you to know, it is so perfect a scene, such a visual for people to be in the city and doing their business and to look, I mean, the distance is great, but you can see everything. So as he was approaching, I, if, if you can get it in your mind's eye to understand that this was widely visual uh, scene of Jesus coming down that everybody could partake in from the city and see this. So no wonder what we're reading here where the place was shaken and stirred. No wonder, because they were able to see what was going on now came down from the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all they had seen. And here's what they said. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees, verse 39, from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered in verse 40, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. In verse 41, as he approached and saw the city, he began to weep. He wept for it. Now, we're going to compare Mark and Matthew as we go along with this. And they are proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. One of the neat things about this is he let them. He didn't stop them from doing it. He didn't tell them, no, my time has not yet come. So they're proclaiming him as the Messiah, the Hosanna, uh, save, we pray you. You know, The purpose of this triumphant entry was to provide salvation for sinners. You and I were objects of this. The fact is that we were targets of this purpose. The people in that city, the people in that time, the people in our time today. 
we understand that when you look at the book of Romans, Paul made it so clear that we need a savior. Romans chapter three, Romans chapter six, for the wages of sin is death, for the gift of God is eternal life. So there was this need for us in humanity to have a savior to come and give his life for us. So Jesus entered into Jerusalem with a purpose and that one purpose, despite the fact that the crowd didn't understand, the fact that his disciples following him apparently didn't understand everything, despite all of that, he stayed the true course. He went and did what he had to do and his eyes never left his target. Some people there looked on with envy. We're going to look at those folks. Some of those people looked on and were moved to rejoice and praise God. We saw that in our text here and they were glorifying Christ and he was making a stir in the city. So either way, whether people were praising him or whether people were envious of him, it, Jesus always makes an impact. People tend to love him or hate him. People tend to, I mean, there's just, Jesus doesn't leave you with a, eh. you know, it's always a passionate response in a way. And people that don't know him don't truly understand what's happening here. The whole city was shaken. Now in Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, the Bible tells us in verse 10 that the city was shaken. One version says it was in an uproar. That's probably the best translation of it. I like that. So the city was in an uproar and they were all saying, who is this? So I think the NIV said they were stirred and that's okay. It's not strong enough language because in the Greek, the word here is the word where we get our seismic for um, earthquakes and things. So the city was shaken, not literally, but metaphorically, the city was shaken and their minds were stirred up with questions and physically, it was like the impact of an earthquake because the people were all the, your attention and everything. You just had to see him coming down off of this mountain in the crowds and Hosanna, Hosanna. And the people seeing this were like, what is going on? What have I, what some people like, what have I even just walked into? What is occurring here? And other people were like, this has to stop. We can't have this. This is going to up, you're going to make the Romans mad. You're going to cause problems for us. We're going to look at all these different people. We're going to look at verses, uh, verse nine of Matthew 21 here in a moment. Their minds were stirred up in verse 10 and they began to ask, who is this? Matthew 21, nine. Crowds went ahead of him and they were shouting. And this is the famous line this time of year. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. All right, the multitudes here. Very few of the people coming down the mountain that day really had any idea exactly what God was working on and what he was doing. Everybody thought they knew. Um, the greatest act of love was right in front of their eyes. This is a huge moment, and some people don't even realize what's happening. And I wonder sometimes how many times I miss what God is doing in these big moments, and I'm sitting there going, I'm trying to get my groceries, or I'm trying to take care of my family, or I'm trying to go and do this or that, and I'm so worried about my everyday routine that I'm missing what God is doing. That, that was a lot of what possibly was happening here. As the disciples were approaching and the, the folks in the city are wondering, who is this? Some didn't really care, I'm sure. They're just wondering, what is all this fuss about? And you know, like when there's a car wreck or a train wreck and everybody rubbernecks and has to look, what happened? What, what's going on? So when things start happening, people get excited and everybody's looking. And so that catches the attention of the people who are looking for God to do anything special on this day, even though, it, I mean, they're pilgrims passing through, they're doing their religious ceremonies. Some probably didn't even care. A lot of others were angry. When they said, who is this? They were not happy. They were not happy at all. Jealousy came in 
and they asked, who is this? But who are they? Now, I've done this before in my church. I've talked about who the people were. When the people were asking, who is he? Well, how about who are they? And the thing about doing that is that we find ourselves in there somewhere. You and me are in that crowd somewhere. We are looking or not looking. We are participating or not. If you've clicked on this, you're obviously worshiping with us or looking for something. You'll find yourself in these people. There's these first group of people I want to talk about. And I've talked about them before. The innocent, the passerby, the person that's just coming through. They had never seen Jesus. They may have heard stories and tales of him. They get caught up in the crowd. If you've ever been just innocently walking through and get caught up in something, you know what I'm talking about. I remember when we lived in New Orleans, we had some friends who innocently went to buy groceries. Something you do all the time, you know. It took them five hours to get those groceries and get home because they got caught up in this little thing called the Mardi Gras parade and had no idea that somehow, I don't know how they missed it, but they decided let's go get groceries. And while they were at the store making their way back, the city's cut off and they can't get home. Five hours. They said they just sitting there eating food that's going to go bad and drinking drinks that's going to go bad and, everything they just made a day of it and sat there and watched the Mardi Gras parade because there was absolutely nothing they could do at that moment but just sit there that's happening too here in our Bible passage there are people that are called up and many of them were there for the Passover they came there for a religious experience and they had no idea that they are getting caught up in the greatest spiritual moment that they could ever witness other than the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The, the, they are seeing this amazing thing, but they're there for Passover. They're pilgrims, they're travelers. They're probably in the marketplace trying to do some shopping and buy some stuff to replace their goods. They have come a long way. I have gone the path and seen the distance. We were driving it in the distance to come from your area and take the pilgrimage into Jerusalem. So they would have needed to restock. They would have needed to buy more supplies. They, they had things to do. And if they're like me or some of you, you know, like if I had to go to Walmart or I had to go to the store, I'm all about get my stuff, get it in, get it in the buggy, get it out, go check out and get back to the vehicle, gone. And I miss opportunities to minister to people talk to people and just be god's representative in that place at that moment and that's on me but i can imagine that a lot of those folks were doing the same kind of thing they're just trying to get their stuff and get out they don't know anything about what's to come um, but they are at the right place at the right time it's a wonderful thing to get caught up in the things that God is doing when you don't even realize that these things are happening. So the next group of people, it's a group of people that are the poor. Um, the poor, according to this class system, they always love Jesus. When you look in the Bible, when Jesus in it encountered poor people, people who needed healing, needed things, they they always seem to have this love for him. Now, the ones that were prosperous and the ones that had power and authority, very few seemed to love Jesus the way the poor love Jesus. And why not? Jesus gave them hope. They weren't getting hope anywhere else. The Pharisees weren't giving them any hope. Their, their life, the system, the class system, wasn't giving them any hope. They were having to beg. They were having to do things to just survive. Jesus gave them hope. He filled them with uh, forgiveness and mercy and grace. This hope, when we read uh, the Chronicles of Narnia to our children, the, one of the tales in the story is that it's always winter and it's never Christmas. And C.S. Lewis talks about the, when hope came, basically, in my words, that 
the snow began to melt because it began to bring hope. These people that are there in the multitude, the crowd, these people are the outcasts of society. Nobody wants to touch them. Nobody wants to spend time with them, but Jesus does. Jesus touches them. Jesus eats with them. Jesus loves them. Jesus puts his hands on them. Jesus heals them. With Jesus, they had hope. They had hope of a new day. They had hope of a new beginning, a new start. They had a new life in Jesus. And it was going to be way better than the way life was going at the moment. So they loved Jesus. They were the people. They, they weren't demanding justice. They were begging for mercy. In America, we could learn a lot from that. Quit demanding justice and start begging for mercy from Almighty God, especially in a time like this. Quit worrying about your rights and trying to be justified in your actions. Beg God for mercy. We are wretched. We are sinners as a nation and as people. No wonder that we don't understand the blessings of God the way our brothers and sisters do in China and other places in Africa and things because they know what it is to suffer and they know what it is to beg for mercy in the midst of the persecution and things that are going on. Some of my brethren and some of our people are acting like this is the end of the world. Folks, throughout church history, look it up. There's always a plague. There's always something that has happened and Christians were able to walk through it. There's quote after quote from Spurgeon, from, from um, Martin Luther, from all these other guys that in the midst of Things like this, what would you do? What would you plan on? And they moved on with ministry and moved on with life. We hardly have it horrible, folks. We got electricity, we got internet, you got all your entertainment, you got all this stuff. And then everybody wants to know, is the apocalypse coming? Come on. Right, what we got going on here is we just need to ask God for mercy in our lives and you need to check up on yourself. And make sure, like these poor people, not running around about worried about justice and worried about us. Look, seek the mercy of God in these times. And make sure you got things right in your heart. And then make sure you got things right in your household. And then make sure everything's right with God in your life, in your ministry, in your neighborhood, in your family. Let this thing bleed over, but it's got to start with you. All the powerful, all the people that were there with an agenda. They missed the point of it all, but it was the poor that understood their need for Jesus and their love for him. The next group that I see there are the political. So the political today, what we are doing with a crisis. And it is a crisis. People are dying as a crisis. But to make a political agenda out of it and try to advance yourself in the midst of other people's suffering is nasty and ugly and disgusting. God will not be pleased with this. But in Jesus' day, the political here are the zealots. He's got some zealots that are in the multitude of the crowd, and they are looking for um, somebody to be their king and help them destroy, defeat, get under, get out from under, the Roman Empire. They hated the Romans. They hated their pagan practices. They hated their gods and goddesses. They hated their debauchery, and rightfully so, they should. But these zealots, they were always preparing for battle. They were ready to fight. And what they see in Jesus, they see the fulfillment of the desire to be free. And they want to go and force this. And Jesus coming and doing his miracles and stuff, they already at one point wanted to make him a king. They already wanted to do this. They saw him as a liberator. They saw him as a conquering king, a, a military power. If we could use this to defeat the Romans and get them out of our country and take care of this plague called the Roman Empire, then here's our Messiah. Let's get behind him. Oh, man, it must have messed him up, though, when he showed up riding a donkey instead of riding on a stallion. I mean, that's not it, it, a conquering king will come in. The symbol of victory was that stallion. 
and he should have ridden in on that. The donkey is a symbol of peace. They don't want peace. They want war. They want a revolution. They don't want redemption. They don't want deliverance from sin. They want deliverance from the Roman Empire. So they're not going to be happy with the Jesus that's coming in. Then there's the other crowd, the political crowd that's got the power. They're not the zealots. They're just trying to keep the status quo. They don't want to be left out. They don't want the Roman Empire to get stirred up to the point where they're not as important as they used to be. They don't want to get them all stirred up where the Roman Empire cracks down and causes some trouble. The Pharisees. The Pharisees stood back and watched, and they were so narrow-minded and prejudiced and intolerant of all of this that they, they knew what Jesus was doing. They're not like the other cats who have no idea what Jesus is doing when he comes in. They're not like these guys that are watching going, who is this? What's happening? They know exactly who he is because they spoke to him and they approached him in Luke 19.39 and they said to stop them from calling him king because that's going to upset the apple cart, man. Can't have that. Then there's the passionate. That's our brothers and sisters that just they can't help but cry and they can't help but dance and they can't help but shout and sing and smile and laugh and praise God in the midst of this. The one on the donkey was the one who was the healer. He's the miracle worker. They know what he's done. They've seen it or heard the stories and they are excited about who he is. Their lives have been transformed forever by his work. They cannot contain their joy. They can't hold it back. They're excited. They love him with so much passion. That's why it's such a, a mixed bag of emotions that's going on between Jesus and the multitude. You've got the, the people who are curious because it's, it's like a train wreck. and They're like, what is that? What is that? Who is this? What's going on? Then there's the people that didn't have a clue. And then there's those who are zealot and ready to go to war. And then there's those guys who are just concerned about their power. And so you got anger, you got excitement from the passionate crowd. They are so stoked and ready and excited about what's happening, even though they don't fully understand it. And then you got Jesus, he's full of sorrow. Those people with their excitement and their joy and everything, Jesus said if they should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. Somebody's going to praise God. And if you ain't going to do it, inanimate objects are going to do it, basically. So we got to praise the Lord. And if we can't find a way to pray, and everybody praises God differently. Some people are more outspoken than others with it. I'm pretty reserved myself. and But at the same time, I don't hold my tongue. I don't remain silent about the one who saved me from hell. I don't remain silent and I don't want to be ungrateful of the one that has secured me in heaven. I don't want to remain silent and not tell people about the precious blood. I'm not going to hold my tongue about what Jesus did and his sacrifice. If you're filled with the Spirit, you can't help but speak out. It's what we do. If you can't find a way to witness and tell somebody or share, you got a spiritual problem. Are you ashamed of your Lord? He made it very clear. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you in heaven for my father. I'm not ashamed of him. I may not shout and holler and run the aisles and do monkey flips, but I tell you what, I ain't going to hold back about my Savior. He, I owe him everything. He did everything for me. And if you are a child of the king, you owe him that. You owe him that praise. And he is precious to you. So all the multitude may not have known what Jesus was doing, what was going on, yet they couldn't remain silent. Everybody had something to say. That's the thing about Jesus. He stirs up a crowd. Now, we know um, what he has done for us, and if we remain silent, that's a problem. The next part I want us to look at is the Savior himself and his sorrows. We're picking back up in... Our, our text. Now we're looking at verse 41 of 19 of Luke. 
And it says, as he approached the city, as he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, verse 42, if you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in the midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. And it happened. The Roman Empire shook them up. Jesus wept over it. His sorrow, this was, this could have been a beautiful, powerful moment, and they missed it. It says there, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. I just wonder how many times in my life I have missed God's visit. There have been moments I caught it, and I saw it, and it was so real. What an experience in my life, but if we're so caught up in the mundane and too busy, that's the beautiful thing about this quarantine. It has made us slow down. Too many of you have been too busy for God, too busy for church, too busy for the things of God, too busy to read your Bible, too, re too busy to go to the church services, too busy because you got this and you got that. Well, guess what? You ain't got it now. It's gone. Now what are you doing with it? Are you squandering it, squandering it all on Netflix? Are you spending all your time on entertainment when you could be focusing and learning and growing and developing? Look, the excuse of too busy is nothing but an excuse, but right now it's gone. It is wiped out. You got the time now. So his triumphant injury in entry into Jerusalem is sealing his doom, and he knows that. The crowd may not understand, but Jesus knew exactly what was going on. This was in the plans. He always predicted his death. And I always amaze, I'm amazed when I read about that, and the disciples like were surprised. Because he said in Luke 19, 21 through 22, uh, verses 43 through 45, he said in Luke chapter 18, verse 31, he said in John chapter 12, uh, verse 37, the knowledge of this was his sorrow. He knew he had to die. He knew When you go to the Garden of Gethsemane and the story is he was in anguish and he was um, sweating like drops of blood and if, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. He knew what he had to face. And him being 100% God and 100% man, the humanity side of him was struggling with this as well he should have. And it shows his compassion towards us and his compassion to understand what we go through as human beings. He's not just some God up on a throne casting judgment down upon us, waiting to strike us with a plague every time we get out of his will. That's not what's happening. Our God came here, lived amongst us. He became human flesh. He walked with us. And it's in verse 41, he wept over the city. Now, he was a man of sorrows. So all the joy and all the anger and all the stuff in the multitude, and Jesus had this sorrow. All was not gold that glittered, somebody said, because before long the story goes from, you know, the whole Hosanna, Hosanna to the crucify him, crucify him. One thing we can learn from the weeping of Jesus, this should encourage people to trust him. Look at his humanity. Look at his, his sympathy for us. Look at his brokenness for the people. He loved his people and does. He loves you. He loves you very much. He, he is troubled when you are troubled. When you have cares, he wants you to cast them upon him. When you have a burden, he wants to share and be walking through that with you. Now, those that desire salvation can approach him. That's what his tears show us. You want salvation? You want to know this Jesus? You can approach him. He wants what is good for us. Now, we should also learn never to speak of the doom of the wicked lightly. 
And this is something that it's not a joke. We shouldn't be so flippant when referring to people who are lost, talking about the wicked. We should have we shouldn't be harsh and we shouldn't make jokes about it. We should be filled with grief. There are people who need Christ. There are people who need salvation. There are people who need this Jesus. And you can't go around making flippant comments about the condemnation of people. It should grieve us. We should be moved to tears and sorrow too. It should burden us. Well, I've had people, they'll tell me a lot of times, I like it better when you're funny when you preach, Brother Wayne. Tell a joke, be funny. Folks, honestly, when you preach through certain texts and you see the pain, and like this one with the sorrowing of Jesus, there's nothing funny about it. It's deep. It's, it's, it's uplifting and it's encouraging to see Jesus be moved with compassion for those people and for us. But at the same time, it grieves my soul. It should grieve your soul that your neighbors are lost. It grieves my soul. We try to be in intentionally inviting and witnessing to it's hard it's hard when people don't come out it's hard when we live in a society like today we have to pray and we have to look for other ways but if you're you're grieving over the lost and grieving over the, the condemnation of people be moved in prayer and ask god for guidance and what you need to say or do what would he have you say what would he have you do and do it now the next part i want us to look at has to do with the second coming because this first triumphant entry is he might have came crying but the second time he's not going to come crying he shook a city the first time when he came in next time he's going to rock the whole world that's the way it's going to go his authority and His power, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, are filled with passages and promises. These are promises that He's going to come again the second time. Somebody smarter than me came up with a lot of them, give or take a few numbers. But about 1,800 references in the Old Testament, 300-something references in the New Testament. I do believe it is very clear that for every prophecy on the first coming, and He did come, you can't deny that historically or religiously or whatever. He did come. Eight times as many say He's going to come the second time. I pray for His kingdom to come. I pray for Him to come in justice and righteousness, but I do grieve because there are people that don't know Him. And if He were to come today, that seals it. Next time, Jesus will not be riding on a donkey. He's not going to come in peace. It's going to be different. He's going to come in power. He's going to come in the clouds. He's going to come in the glory of the Father, a flaming fire. He's going to come with power and authority, with the shout of the voice of an archangel. He's going to come and be accompanied by the saints. He's going to come back and be accompanied by heavenly beings, angels. He's going to come and suddenly and unexpectedly and like a thief in the night. People scoff and they say, where is he? When is he coming? They were looking for the Messiah the first time and they missed it. There's going to be so many people miss them on the second time. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be missing opportunities to make sure people know him so that when he does come back, when he does show back up on the scene, that the people that I have encountered in my sphere of influence have had an opportunity to hear who he is, reject him, accept him, whatever. I just want to make sure they know who he is. He's not going to come back as a little old lamb. He's going to come back as the lion. Next time, he will shake things up. Now, there are those who claim and are choosing ignorance. I have heard people say this. Oh, I heard one lady said, or young lady, girl, if I remain ignorant about this i don't she said i don't really want to know what's going to happen but that way if it does happen i can say well i was ignorant and i just didn't know there 
is a lie from the devil in that. That's not going to work. That's not going to save you. Choosing to be ignorant. We are to be seeking truth. Do you want to know the truth or do you want to be ignorant and live your life the way you want to? And then when life catches up with you, either by death or by his coming, you will, oh, well, I didn't know. You think that's going to work with God? That's not going to work with God. You can't claim ignorance. Other people want to choose to shut their eyes so they cannot see. That's not going to work either. You can't stop up your ears so you do not hear. You're still going to be judged. You're still going to be held accountable. Those that, and especially in America, I mean, how many times have you heard the gospel? How many times has the gospel been presented to you? There are people in this world that had never heard it. You need to worry about yourself. You've heard it so many times. What's keeping you from giving it, giving into it, surrendering your life to it, and living for Him? You will be held so accountable, especially here in America, especially people in our in the South and the Bible Belt. How many times have you heard this message? You think you're going to get out of this? No. And it's a grieving thing. It's a sad thing that you would, because God's so great and he loves you so much and you can have this. This doesn't have to be. You just don't want to give up your little pet sin. You think God's going to take all the fun away? That's not what he's doing. God wants you to have a better life, a pleasing life to him, an abundant life. Jesus said, I came to give an abundant life. So, those that have chosen to have a hard heart. Why? You refuse to be converted. You don't want to hear it. I was a skeptic. I didn't believe all this mess either. I didn't care about this book. I didn't care about all that. I didn't know what was truth. You know why? I wanted to live my life like I wanted to live it. Bottom line. But I had to come to a point where I had to realize... Do I want to know the truth or do I want to be right or do I just want to be ignorant and live the way I want to? And it comes a point where you have to say, all right, is this truth and seek it? And God says, if you seek me, you will find me. And it shouldn't be hard. His name's Jesus. He did all the work for you. The gospel. A lot of people will not recognize this wonderful thing. And in our world, the tears of the father over a wayward son, the tears of a mother over a lost daughter are nothing compared to the tears of Jesus over those people. It's a beautiful thing. They're tears of heartbreak. But none match the tears of a weeping Jesus. He's got all the power and authority, yet he, we he wept over these people. He weeps over the lost. He weeps over us. How can we escape and ignore such a great salvation? There will be no excuse. So what I want to challenge you with this morning, are you sold out to this Jesus? This Jesus who came in, this Jesus who laid down his life, this Jesus who died and took his, nobody took his life. He laid it down. He had the power and the authority to raise it up again. Nobody did this. He took the keys. He did all that stuff. Don't ever doubt his love for you. Don't ever doubt his compassion, but don't doubt his power and authority and know when he comes again, he will rule and he will reign with an iron scepter. It's not going to be like the first time. Everybody's worried about end times. You need to be worried about you and Jesus. And even you say, well, I am saved. I'm okay. How's your walk going? What are you doing with all this time you got? You giving it to him? You using it for him? All right. I challenge you with these things. If you don't know him, pray. Say, Lord, I, I need to know this Jesus. Are you real? I challenge you, if you're a skeptic, hey, God, if you want me, come get me. Go ahead. Are you brave enough? If you want me, come get me. He'll break you. If you're a member of the church and you're a saved born again believer what are you doing with it look for opportunities to grow 
mature and to witness. Father, I thank you so much for this time and I thank you for Palm Sunday, for the Lord Jesus coming and laying down his life for us. We thank you for the, the emotional weeping, the crying, how you showed your love for us in that. Thank you that there is mercy and there is still time for grace to be extended to lost people to come and to know you. We pray, God, today that somebody watching this needs you, they be saved, that they seek your face and they pray. They pray and ask Jesus to save them. They pray and confess their sins and repent. And God, for the rest of us to know you and we're not living it, or either we're not doing the things we should the way we should, I pray, God, this has been a wake-up call for us and that we approach you with humbleness, seeking forgiveness, and giving our lives and surrendering completely to you and letting you rule and reign. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.